Yo, what's up? Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. It's time to get on. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Working with Mass Transit. Uh, we're still in the coronavirus edition, so, you know, might as well have some fun and put some videos together. And I thought we'd take a little departure tonight. We definitely had some craziness over the weekend, getting Grafana and Prometheus and everything up and running. And that was that was a lot of fun. I mean, that was that was some really cool stuff. And I I kept playing with it after the broadcast Sunday and came up with some pretty cool dashboards. It's it's a pretty sophisticated tool. I'm pretty pleased with it. So definitely had some fun there. Um, for tonight, I want to do something a little different, though. We're going to take a little departure. We're going to cut back to a little bit more simplicity, uh, and we're going to we're going to move the complexity to the broker. We're basically going to look at RabbitMQ, how it works with Mass Transit, how the different settings within Mass Transit affect what you get on the broker. Um, when looking for content, I started looking at like old Stack Overflow questions and like what what's most commonly coming up over the past few months and you know, the, the complex stuff is really cool to see how powerful the framework is and the kind of things you can do with it. But, you know, I think getting back to some of the basics and asking, answering some simple questions is a good place for tonight. So I'm going to focus on RabbitMQ tonight. I keep a lot of metrics on downloads of NuGet packages and such. And RabbitMQ is far and away the most popular transport for mass transit. I mean, it's it, it's it's the major download. I mean easily by a factor of, I could probably say, five to one. Um, but again, it's hard to say. A lot of corporate enterprise users that use mass transit, they cache NuGet packages locally, and you know they have a lot of different things in their build servers, so it's, it's just different. You know, when you look at the GitHub metrics and see projects that reference it, there's you know well over a thousand projects that reference the RabbitMQ transport compared to the others but again that's that's public repo metrics so it's it's hard to know for sure so anyway with that you know i want to get started i just wanted to kind of give a little background there um this one will also end up on youtube afterwards so if you aren't watching live on twitch and you're watching on youtube try to join us when we live on twitch i'm trying to get to a somewhat regular schedule but once the weather gets better that's gonna be entirely dependent upon the weather so so i want to jump in i'm gonna I'm going to create, I've, I've created a simple new console app, and I thought I would start from that. Um, let me go ahead and get the uh, font size back up here. It's one thing I didn't do before we started here. So we'll get just another pixel in there for people who want to be able to see. Okay. So I've stood up just like I've, you know, I'm all Docker now. So I've set up just a brand new uh, Docker image for RabbitMQ. So I have a completely clean broker. If I go into the management interface, which I've connected into, I can see there isn't anything here yet. No queues, no exchanges, we're completely clean. So we're gonna be able to see exactly what happens when we create our project and we do things on it. So, um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna add the NuGet package of RabbitMQ. So it's going to be mass transit.rabbitmq. Uh, I'm going to stick with the GA version. I'm not going to use the alpha. So we'll pull in 624. I don't know why that does that. That's really weird. I'm going to have to get JetBrains to fix that. Um, it's like it doesn't know my window size. So we've just added the mass transit.rabbitmq transport, which is going to pull in the mass transit DLL for us as well. So that's all going to be set up. And we're going to just create a simple bus using the out-of-the-box configuration, okay, using RabbitMQ. Uh, we're going to change this to async task so we can use the start async. Um, and for now, we won't configure any receive endpoints. I will add the host configuration in here, though, because this is kind of the, um, this is where you can specify how to connect to the host. And there's a number of different options. You know, you can specify a full URI host address, which if I was wanting to do that, I would have to say rabbitmq colon slash slash localhost. And that's enough. And I could, I could specify that. I'll get my editor to quit reformatting for me. 
Um, that's one way I could do it. But, you know, we're, we're kind of in a modern world. We don't have to do that anymore. That was like the original syntax is everything was URI based. You can also just say localhost uh, or whatever the server name is. You don't have to be any more explicit beyond that. It just takes the defaults. And in fact, if you leave it out entirely, it defaults to localhost with a virtual host of slash. So you'll see a lot of the examples don't put anything because they assume you're running the broker local. Um, but I'm going to say localhost, and I'm going to use the default virtual host, but if I wanted one, I could put one in here, and I'd just specify it. Um, things I can specify are things like username and password. Now, guest is the default. Okay, so guest guest is default. I'll put that in here just so you can kind of see that it's there. I do have the option of using SSL. Um, and if I do want to do an SSL config, I can do things like I can specify a certificate. I can specify the S protocols, passphrase, path, all of that type of stuff is there. Policy, different things. So like if the certificate doesn't match because it's, it's an untrusted CA or something like that, all of that stuff is there. Um, so yeah, you can do that if you want to. We're just gonna stick simple tonight. We're gonna stick with guest guest, and we're gonna kind of get into what connects on the broker. So once I create that bus, I have to start it. So I'm gonna do await bus control dot start async. And I'm always gonna to wanna to stop it if it starts successfully. And so that's kind of our base project right there. Now I'm going to point out a couple of things. Start async will always just wait forever if I do it like this, because it will always try to connect to the broker. It's, it's very resilient. It assumes you wanted to start. You didn't give it a reason not to. If I wanted to say timeout, I could say, I could give this a time span of like 30, I think. Oh wait, no, I have to do it this way. I have to say new cancellation token source. Cause so, every, so the only parameter for start async is a cancellation token. And that cancellation token would be canceled. So if you're like in, in, in hosted service or something like that in the ASP.NET generic host, it will trigger that cancellation token if it won't cancel, but that's not gonna happen. So we're gonna create a cancellation token. cancellation token source and we're actually going to put a time span from seconds of 30 in here um, and now you'll see that start async is lighting up green saying hey you can you have a cancellation token you can pass so awesome it's all good to go I just realized I didn't uh, mute here hold on I want to get on a group text channel and have everything blowing up. Um, so with that cancellation token, I'm basically saying if I don't start within 30 seconds, I want to time out. I want to die. I want to cancel. I'm done with it. Um, so I'm going to pass that there. Now here, I don't want to do that because that cancellation token will likely be gone before I'm done. But needless to say, if I want to abort the start async, you have to pass a cancellation token. If you don't, it will continuously retry to connect to the broker forever. And it's an exponential back off. I mean, it'll start to where it only checks every 30 seconds to see if the broker's up. But the whole point is we expect our services to be resilient and start async is that way. If you don't tell it you want to stop, it's going to try forever. Um, So that's our basic project. If we F5 and go, it should just run. We should see it start and stop. There'll be a connection to the broker and then it'll just exit. And if we go look at the broker, there's still nothing there. No exchanges, no queues. So Mass Transit used to create a temporary queue every time you ran the bus. But since I'm not doing anything, it no longer auto starts that queue, so it doesn't create it. So if you aren't doing anything special, those temporary queues just don't fill up your queue broker anymore. So that's kind of a nice takeaway there. But now I want to add something. So first, mass transit fo is focused around message types, and, and message types are defined by the message contract. Let's create a namespace out here for our message contracts. Let's call this um, sample.contracts. 
And within this namespace, we want to create a just a simple command. We're going to have a command that we're going to send. So I'm going to call this command. Um, let's just call this update account for lack of a better cool name. Um, not going to worry about that. I'm going to access about it if I don't though. So I'm just going to say. Change naming rule for interfaces. I'm going to go to interfaces and I'm going to add one that is just uppercase. Okay, great. Thank you. So that is a message contract. It has no properties in it right now. The properties aren't important for now um, because we're just going to see how this gets built out in the broker. So to set up a now because this is a command. Technically, we, commands are meant to be sent. We don't usually publish commands because publish is sort of for events and commands are more to be sent. Um, but let's see what happens if I actually just create a receive endpoint in my bus up here. So I'm gonna create a receive endpoint. I'm gonna call this my command. I'm gonna call this my account service. And I'm gonna configure that endpoint. Now, because I'm configuring RabbitMQ, I have a number of different methods available on here. First, I can specify durable. By default, durable is true. So messages will be written to disk on the broker and acknowledged by the broker once they're written to disk. So I'm not going to change that because I'm cool with that. These are commands. I want them to stick around. Exclusive. If I specify exclusive, it's going to mean that nobody else can connect to this queue, the queue that's created for this receive endpoint. I don't use this too often, so but it's there. Lazy, lazy is cool. If I say lazy equals true, if I say lazy equals true, this is going to avoid overloading memory. So the way RabbitMQ works is it tries to keep all of the queue messages in memory. If you tell it to make a queue lazy, it won't keep all of the messages in memory. So if you have a queue that backs up a lot, Telling it to be lazy is a way to save memory on your broker, especially if it's you know, relatively low volume or you know, it just doesn't matter. Your mileage may vary, but it's a tuning parameter to look at for RabbitMQ. Um, if you specify auto delete, it will automatically take down the queue when the bus exits. So when the connection is severed and these receive endpoints go away, whether through stopping the bus or whatever, it will automatically delete those cues from the broker once it gets around to collecting, you know, garbage. So, um, auto start, not a big deal. It's just so you can tell it to not automatically start that queue. I don't recommend that unless you know what you're doing. It's mainly used for the bus endpoint, which now longer no longer auto starts. You can also do things like consumer priority. So you can say that certain consumers are higher priority to than other consumers on the same queue. So you can have like certain instances that are more likely to get messages. All this stuff gets passed through to headers within the connection for this receive endpoint. Um, exchange type. By default, Mass Transit uses fan out exchanges for all exchanges it creates. You can change that and I'll go over those here after a little bit. Um, Exclusive consumer also means that if I create a consumer on this queue, I'm the only one that can have it. So input address is read only. You can read the input address after a receive endpoint is configured, but all of these settings could change it. So it needs to be like the last statement in your thing. Prefetch count. This is one that's really worth looking at. So the way RabbitMQ works is when you create a connection to the broker and you create a consumer, you tell it how many messages you want to prefetch from the broker. So for RabbitMQ, I usually set this to the number of messages I can process in a second times two. So if I know I can process 100 messages a second, I might set this to 200. If I only can process 10 messages a second, I might set this to 20. Uh, it really just depends on you know what kind of throughput you're getting so on and so forth. Yeah, so let's create some commands. Question in the chat says, huh, could that be made more dynamic based on throughput? 
it used to sort of work and they used to have channel specific uh, quality of service where you could specify the prefetch count on the channel and you could adjust it dynamically. With the introduction of quorum queues, that doesn't work anymore. Quorum queues use raft to replicate instead of the old replication method, so they're significantly more efficient. But you can't use global QoS with raft queue with quorum queues. So it's it's one of those things that you would have to like disconnect the consumer and reconnect it. So right now, I mean, there is a filter. Uh, well, that's getting into sideways. It is possible to change the prefetch count right now. And if I have time, I can go into that if it's interesting. Um, but it really depends upon how the queue endpoints are set up. So um, now I need to create a consumer for my command. So I'm going to go over here in my, and I'm keeping this in one file because I'm trying to keep the complexity on the on, on our side down so that we don't have a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I didn't want to do this in the Twitch sample because there's so many different um, classes and projects in there. I, I just wanted to avoid and kind of get us to just a simple little project to kind of, so that, you know, all the stuff that's happening in the broker, we can focus on that instead. Update account. So the consumer I'm going to create is just going to do nothing because I don't really care at this point. I'm just trying to get something to wire up into the broker. Um, so I've set a prefetch count. I've set lazy as true. I don't need to, but whatever. Um, I'm going to configure my consumer, which is my account consumer. And I'm just going to do that for now. I'm going to run this, which is just going to start the bus, stop, and have a nice day. And then we're going to go look at what's in the broker. It's going to just run and exit. I mean, it's not going to do anything super exciting. So the whole point is we want to see what's happening in RabbitMQ by this. So by running that, you can see that an exchange, two exchanges were created. The first exchange created was called sample.contracts colon update account. This maps to the message type of our update account command. Now this exchange is created. It's a fan out exchange. It's durable, so it's going to stick around. And it has a binding to the account service. But this is the account service exchange. So you can see we have the account service queue, which when I mouse over it, it shows a queue. Is it really a mouse? Do you mouse over something with a touchpad? I don't know. We're gonna have to come up with a new term for that. Um, so the update account exchange is bound to this exchange, which is the account service exchange. And the account service exchange, which is also fan out, is bound to the account service queue. Now, Mass Transit has done this since the very first versions, and the reason it does it is because to send directly to a queue, you have to either specify a exchange, a blank exchange name, and set the routing key equal to the queue name, which means you can't use the routing key for routing, or you can send to an exchange that's bound to the queue. You can't send to a you directly. So what when we looked at the topology for the broker for mass transit, the approach we took is that we said we're going to create an exchange with the same name as the queue because this gives us some actually really cool features. We can say, okay, I want to keep a copy of every message sent to my endpoint. And I can do that by just creating another queue and binding it to that account service exchange. That, create, that lets me do like a wiretap, which is actually a pattern for messaging to say, okay, well, I'm going to create a separate queue and it's going to keep a copy of every message sent to this endpoint because everything binds to the queue name exchange. Really cool capability because when you're troubleshooting, you're like, okay, well, why didn't the service do what I want? I can go at that queue and then I could go to my wiretap queue and look at every message that was received. So really cool way to kind of steal traffic and look at it and figure out what's going on. Um, so that's what's created by doing that. We can see that my account service queue was created. My account service queue has 
durable, the arguments, Q mode is lazy. So all of that stuff was passed through. I don't have any messages in it right now. It's currently idle because my process exited. I have no consumers on it, consumer utilization zero, no policies. I haven't done anything on the broker to set up policies. Let's add a breakpoint in here to Let's just add a read line just to let us kind of break out when we're ready to go. Um, and then we'll run that. The reason I put that console read line in a task.run is because console read line blocks the primary thread. And if you have an async task main and you say console.read line, you basically kill like an entire section of the threading TPL and basically bad things happen. So by putting async task await task run console read line, it does the same thing, but it doesn't block the main program thread. So just something to keep in mind. That's why I do that. Going back to our RabbitMQ console, you can see our state is still idle. Nothing's really happening right now, but we have one consumer now, and we can see the consumers are listed here. It has the channel, which is the connection. It has a consumer tag, which if I had logging turned on, we would be able to see it. It has a prefetch count of 20, which matches what I set for my prefetch count of here. So depending on how, much, how many messages are in the queue, it's going to pre-read up to 20 of them. And it's not using a lot of memory. It's just, yeah, so we're there. We now have it. Our activity status is up. There's nothing there. If we go back and look at the channel, we can see that it's tied to this queue, same prefetch count. It's on this connection, which is local. I can see the connection details. It's .NET, the client API is mass transit. Everything is under there. It has the version, the .NET version, all that fun stuff. Um, Now, update account is technically a command. Now, if I, if I wanted to send a message to that consumer, I could say bus, well, hold on, was it bus control dot send? I would have to get the send endpoint first. So I would be able to say endpoint bare endpoint equals await bus control dot get send endpoint. And I could pass it a URI of Q colon. Well, let's just say I want to send it to the exchange because it's RabbitMQ account dash service. And then I'm going to say endpoint.send. I send my update account command. And it doesn't have any properties right now, so we're fine. Um, uh, one of the questions is why can't I send from bus control? Um, you need to get a send endpoint to send to. Um, because send by default doesn't know where the message has to go. So you have to actually use get send endpoint to get a send endpoint, obviously. And then you can send using the send endpoint. I'm going to add a simple console write line to my service so that I know that I got the command. And there's nothing in it, so it doesn't really matter. Let's put a value in it so that we have something useful to show. Context.message. Let's say account number. Try to get only property on there. We'll make it just a simple string. And we'll add account number. One, two, three, four, five. Now when we run this, we should see command received. Command received, one, two, three, four, five. 
Nothing changed out here. We still just have the queue for account service. We still have the same exchanges. Nothing has changed. Bingo, bingo. Okay. Another way to send, you know, so, you know, the question about why can't I just send from bus control? You know, Mass Transit supports two modes of sending. You can send and you can publish. Now, technically, if I didn't want to do this, Because of the way it's configured right now, I could actually just call bus control dot publish. Account updated and see what happens. So my command was still received. And the reason the command was received is because when you publish, it looks at the message type and it uses the message type to get the destination address for the message. So instead of asking for a send endpoint, when you call publish, it says, oh, I have an update account. I know the type for that is sample.contracts colon update account. So I'm going to send it to that exchange and anything bound to that exchange will get a copy of that message. So when it's published to update account, it says, oh, well, I'm bound to the account service exchange, which is bound to the account service queue, and it gets a copy routed through the RabbitMQ exchange fabric. Makes total sense for events, and I know a lot of people use this so that they don't have to hard code to the endpoints of their services because they know what they're doing. They're like, well, I only have one receive endpoint that is bound for that message type, and I don't want to have to know the address, so I just publish my command. Totally acceptable. Nobody's going to care. I mean, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, well, semantically, you're doing it wrong. You're just taking advantage of the fact that RabbitMQ knows how to route messages by type, and you know you have a single consumer for that type. Now, what if I had another consumer for that type on a different endpoint? Like, let's say I have this account consumer here. Let's say I have another, I have, you know, just have another account consumer. It gets the same thing. We'll just call it another command received. If I go in and create another receive endpoint, and I call this one another account service, I don't need to make it lazy. I'll give it a prefetch count of 10. Doesn't matter. I'll give it another account consumer. When I run it this time, Assuming I actually pressed the key. Oh, I never hit, I never exited, so I have to like go. So now when I run it, both of those are gonna get called because I published. And because I published, I sent it to that update account exchange, which is called sample contracts.update account. I can see that another account service. That's a new exchange that's been created. But if I go to sample update account, I now see that there are two bindings on the broker, account service and another account service. Both of those are there. When I published, it went to both of them. If I go to another account service, it's that queue. That queue has that consumer connected. That consumer is connected. That one has the prefetch count of 10, so you can tell the difference. Both of those are there. And I can see all my channel connections are here. Each receive endpoint gets its own channel to RabbitMQ. So I can see the one with 20 is my account consumer and the one with 10 is my another account consumer. This channel I think is just the default one. I don't think it has anything on it, yeah. If I go to queues, it's still just the two queues that I have there. And because those exchanges are all created as fan out, they get created like that. Let's look at a couple other things that we can change. And I know I say let's look at a lot because you know that's what we're doing basically is just kind of exploring some of the features of mass transit. Um, I'm gonna go out to RabbitMQ. I'm gonna do a little cleanup here. I'm basically just gonna, I'm gonna delete this exchange because I wanna get rid of it. I wanna get rid of all the bindings. 
So now I just have my account service. It's you know the two receive endpoints that I had there. Um, now with configuration of the receive endpoints, I'm also going to take this lazy out. It was just so it didn't reformat my code for me. I'm going to make it so that the account consumer. I'm going to set configure consume topology to false. And I want to look at what this changes. So I'm going to run the code. Doing anything? Recreated my contract. Bound to another account service. Do I have a connection? Do I have my channels? Oh, I got an exception. Operation interrupted. Oh, yeah, because I'm dumb. I changed the. I saw a perfect example of something to see. What is the exception that I just got? People see this stuff and they wonder what goes on. Client exception interrupted. I don't even know how to show the whole thing. Um, basically what happened is the Q mode, invalid Q mode argument for account service received none but was expecting the value of lazy. So when I tried to declare my Q at startup, since I took the lazy off of it, it didn't match what was configured on the broker. And so it got mad and said, yeah, I'm not gonna let you in because you aren't looking at this the way that I want to, it's expected to be configured. And usually it's a sign that you've done something, you know, you have an inconsistent way of referring to cues. Um, you can go out and you can, I can, you know, the smart play for me right now is to put the lazy back so that it matches. And then when I run it, everything will be fine um, once I kill the process and start it over. Um, I could delete the queue and let it recreate it, but you know, if I had that in production and there were a lot of messages there, that would be a bad thing. Anyway, slight diversion, but good to know. I always like it when stuff breaks because stuff breaks in reality and you got to know how to handle it. Um, it could, you would get the same kind of error if the queue was originally defined as durable and you changed it to non-durable. It would say, hey, these don't match. Did you do something wrong? You need to, you need to recover this because you might have just screwed up and you, know, you meant for it to be durable, but this is saying non-durable and now all your messages are lost because it didn't tell you. So, so I published this time and because I set configure consume topology to false, when I go out to the broker now for that queue, my account service doesn't have any exchange bindings. So by setting configure consume topology false, I can avoid getting bindings in my broker for things that I don't want routed through publish, to me anyway. Um, and that's useful because like, if you're like, hey, I want my commands to always be explicitly specified for destinations and I don't want people to just publish them and assume they will work, um, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to configure consume topology for my command endpoints to false and make that will require that all the messages get sent directly to that endpoint. They won't get there by default. Um, yeah, so that's what that is. Now, this also lets me have some control over the type of stuff that I bind. So what configure consume topology does, which it defaults to true, so don't bother, don't, this is just if you want to turn it off is it looks at the consumer, it looks at the message types that are handled by the consumer, and it does the same thing for sagas, routing slips, all of that. And it goes out and connects to those message types for you automatically. That's configuring the consume topology of the broker. Now, there are three different types of topology in mass transit, consume, publish, and send. And I'll cover consume and publish as part of this to show how it maps to RabbitMQ, because those are the ones that have the biggest influence. Um, but by setting this to false, I could now come in here and very explicitly say, okay, well, I would actually like to bind to the update account command. 
so that I can get that. And that's basically saying, I don't want any con automatic configuration, but I want to explicitly bind to something. So now when I run this again, I will see both consumers get it because now I've told it I want to bind to this type. And now you can see my command is also received again. So this bind of update account is doing exactly what would automatically happen because the consumer calls or is an I consumer of update account. Many different ways to accomplish the same problem or to solve the same problem. The interesting thing about bind is it actually has configurations. I can come in and say things like, I can specify a routing key. I can specify the exchange type. I can specify binding arguments, which they're just passed straight through to RabbitMQ. So if there's things I don't support, it'll let you specify those. You can specify arguments that are passed to the exchange, which are just like key value pairs, all sorts of options there. Um, I'm not gonna pass anything now. I just kinda wanted to show how that worked because we're gonna go into that a little bit more later. What else is there to show on that? Not a whole lot, okay. Um, so we covered send, we covered publish. Another one of the common questions that I saw was, I don't like the way you name stuff. <laughs> like I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna make it so that my account update commands go to an account topic or my, you know, things that people can just send to the account topic and they go to my account consumer. Um, so there's a way to do that and it's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to take this other account service off for now because we'll come back to that later. Uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to clean up a couple queues out of here because I want them gone. Delete that queue. Start fresh. Go out here. I'm going to delete that exchange. So now I just have my message type. I'm going to go ahead and delete that too because I, you know, I don't want that. I don't want that thing out there. I want some. I want some type of exchange that that I send to, that I know about. So I'm picky, I wanna configure my, I'm not picky, that sounds like a bad term. I have a very distinct style of working with RabbitMQ and I would like to use mass transit, but I already know how to use RabbitMQ and I've created some things already that do work for me. So I send all of my account updates, currently get sent to an account exchange in RabbitMQ and I would like to consume those with mass transit. So the first thing I could do is I could say, okay, well, just send them to account. And I could just come in here, specify configure consume topology equal to false. And I could just bind that account exchange myself. And then anything sent to account is gonna come to my consumer. So if I get rid of the publish, go back to the send, and I say exchange account, and then I call send update account. What is this gonna do for me? Let's find out. Because what I wanna look at is what the broker looks like after it's all done. I got my command, received my one, two, three, four, five. Um, a window. And if I go out now and look at the broker, I can see I have an exchange called account it's bound to the account service exchange, which is about bound to the account service queue. So this allowed me to pick an arbitrary exchange on the broker and just bind it to my receive endpoint. And then any messages sent to that exchange will come to my receive endpoint. Now, say I already had an existing system in place and that was the case. And let's say I had a different command out here called delete account. But my consumer didn't handle that, but I bound to that endpoint and I'm gonna get those messages now. So I'm gonna send an update account. And you know what? I'm also gonna come back and you know, later say, oh, by the way, I wanna call delete account on 67890. So I'm gonna send two messages, update account and delete account. This is gonna run. I'm still gonna see my command received. I'm going to exit that because I don't want to forget it's there. And I'm going to go out to my broker. I'm going to look at my queues. And suddenly I have a new queue. So what happened here? 
I have a queue called account service skipped. And it has one message in it. I can see that it's there. I'm going to get that message and look at the body. And what I can see is that it is a JSON message. It, it has the appropriate details. It has a reason. So when something gets moved to the skipped queue, it has a reason. And the reason is dead letter. And the reason this ended up in the dead letter is the message type sample contracts delete account. I don't have a consumer for that on that endpoint. And since I don't have a consumer, Mass Transit doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't want to just throw it away because then you have message loss and you might not know what happened. Um, it doesn't really want to throw an error because it isn't really an error. And so by moving it to a skipped queue, it's basically like these are dead letters. You sent them here, but the address is unknown. Nobody is going to consume them and nobody consumed them. So I'm just going to move them into skipped and you need to figure out what to do with them. In many cases, it's like, oops, this was an old message. We no longer process it on the endpoint. Maybe I need to shovel those over to a different queue, or maybe they're duplicates because you, know, you have a new end receive endpoint that has that consumer on it now. There could be a million different reasons, but all, when you see things in the skipped queue, it's because you don't have a consumer for that type on there. And because we just bound to that exchange, and we aren't actually managing the topology by publish or send, and we're just sending to it, those delete account messages aren't handled. So they're gonna go into the skipped queue. So that's how that works. Let's see, Albert joined the chat. Does that mean there is a default attempted delivery before moving to skipped? Yes, so the message tries to be processed and you can see that it was processed and then it was moved to that endpoint because it was originally delivered to that account exchange. It was sent from that source address, which is temporary, which is only created if it's needed. Um, the message is there when it was sent, what machine sent it, but it was sent to account and it doesn't show where it was received from. That's interesting. Oh, but you know it's skipped. You know it's the same queue because all it does is add skip to the end. So it was consumed by account service, but skipped because there weren't any consumers. It runs it through the pipeline. It tries to deliver it to anything in memory, but there isn't a consumer for it. And since it doesn't get marked as consumed, it gets moved to dead letter. So I'm going to purge those messages out of there. In fact, I might just delete that queue so it goes away. Get rid of it. Um, back to our exchanges. It does create an exchange for it. Um, I think that's because I because it's just treated as another endpoint, and so it creates the exchange that it binds to the queue. Since I deleted the queue, I'll delete the exchange as well. Um, I think the reason that I still create exchanges and queues for skipped and error is because that way, if you specified a routing key, it's retained versus using the direct send to feature with a blank exchange and using the routing key for the queue name would lose the routing key from the message. So that's why I don't do that. Um, okay, so we've covered some topology, how to bind to arbitrary exchanges. Now we want to change the name of a message type. It's like, I like your topology. I love that you set up my broker. It's totally cool. Let's just do that. I just want to call it something else. So when I configure the broker, or when I configure Mass Transit, I have the ability to override how messages are named. So I could come in here and just say message. And I could say update account. And I could just come in and say m dot set entity name update. So I just want to call it update. Or I want to call it update account. And I don't want the namespace and all that other stuff on there. I could just say do that. By doing that, just changing the name right there, I'm going to go back out here. I think I'm just going to leave this the way it is. Right, because I haven't published, so nothing has been created out here. I am now going to call, because I took consume configure topology off, I'm going to go back to publish. I don't want any artificial sends here. I'm going to go back to just calling publish on update account. I'm going to run that. Uh, 
I received the command, so it still worked, which is great. But when I go out to look at the broker and I look at my queues, I have my account service here. And when I look at the bindings, it's bound to update account. Oh, that's that old exchange that I created. Um, it's bound to update account. So it changed the name. It's now calling the exchange update account for the exchange message for the update message. And it's bound to that exchange. So I changed the entity name. It's now something different. Awesome. Just what I wanted to do. Delete the account exchange because that was the one we created temporarily. So the account service and the update account. That's the exchange for that message type because I changed the name of it. I said that I wanted it to be called update account instead. You can do that on a global scale. So one of the questions in chat is, so does that clean up the old bindings? No, you have to do that manually. Mass Transit isn't going to go remove bindings from the broker for you because it doesn't know all the consumers on your network. So you may have moved that service to another service, or you may have moved that code to another service that is still using those bindings. Mass Transit can't assume that it is the only thing talking to the broker, so it is never going to go out and clean up bindings for you. Um, that is something that you would have to do yourself if you see my bindings out there. Uh, it's especially as important if you see stuff ending up in the skipped queue, is if you move something to a different queue to reduce a bottleneck on a queue, um, you have to go out and explicitly remove that binding of that message type to the old queue and so they only go to the new queue or it could fill up your disk space pretty quick. So definitely pay attention to those counters on there and seeing the number of ready messages. When I did the video Sunday night, I was freaking out because I was looking at the overview and the number of ready messages was at like 4,000. And it was because I had ran that client app for like three hours and I had a prefetch count with a batch consumer of like four. And so I was processing four messages every 10 seconds. And so I had a huge backlog in my broker because of a configuration issue on how I hadn't configured the prefetch count for that batch consumer. So I fixed that. It's in the develop branch. That'll be coming out shortly. But uh, yeah, that's, that's why those counters are there. That's why monitoring is awesome. Um, one other thing that I want to cover on this that is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, oh, I want to do one more thing on the naming. You can create your own entity name formatter. So let's say I come out here and say my formatter colon I entity name formatter. Wait, is it? No, that's endpoint not entity. I was to say that that one's completely different. So this has one method, format entity name, and it's going to give me a T. And I could say, okay, well, I just want to use type name. So I could just say return type of T dot name. If you know that you don't have like weird generic names with illegal characters and stuff in there, rock on. Um, good for you. Uh, instead of doing this this way, I can say config dot message topology. And I want to configure the topology. And I want to say topology dot set that not working. Oh, config dot message topology dot entity name formatter equals new my formatter. Oh, I think I have to call like set entity name formatter. Yeah. I don't do this too often, obviously. Um, and so because this is just using the name, if I go to entity name formatter, now if I go out to the broker and I, or if I come in here and I run this, it will use that entity name formatter to create the publish entity names as well as the consumed topology binding names. And when I go to the broker now, I'll see an exchange called update account which is just the name of the type without the namespace. So you can override that as well. I'm just gonna delete some of these old exchanges. You can see the update account. It's now bound to the account service exchange. Rock and roll. So again, different ways to change the names if you don't like the default naming. I'm gonna take all that out now. 
Um, the last thing I want to show, because we're coming up in an hour and this is getting really long, but there's a lot of things you can do. You have full control over the broker. So, I mean, these are a lot of things, the questions that come up. <laughs> can you get this in Mass Transit 2101? No, Matt, that's like, that's like the 2013 version of Mass Transit. Y'all need to update. <laughs> that's just getting silly out there. There's definitely the lulls there. <laughs> Um, okay, so the last thing I want to go over is direct exchange binding. So you can change the types of exchange. You can do topic and direct, and each of them have their own behaviors for the way they route messages. And to do that, I'm going to create like two receive endpoints with the same service on it. And the intent is that I want to make it so that only certain instances of the service would receive things. So I'm going to call this account service A and account service B. And imagine that these are running on two separate machines. You know, one of them is for handling, you know, customer A and one of them is for handling customer B. Um, I'm going to turn off automatic topology binding because I'm going to be specifying the broker topology myself. And as I do this, I'm gonna go out to here and I'm gonna delete all these queues because I wanna get rid of them. You can just reset a vhost, but we're gonna just do it this way. I reset a vhost by just deleting it and recreating it, but you know, that's sort of like a reset, right? This computer doesn't work, reset it, buy a new one. Yeah, good plan. Find one in stock, everybody's working from home. Um, so they both have the account consumer. They're basically the same. One is service A and service B. And I wanna make it so that when I publish, or when, I, and I can do it with publish or send, so I'll show it both ways. But I wanna send an update account command, and I want this account command to only go to account service B, but I don't wanna know who customer service B is. But I know, but I know the account categorization or grouping or whatever. Um, so I'm gonna add the bind in here. I'm gonna to bind to that update account command. But I'm gonna change some things on my binding. So the first thing I'm gonna change is I'm gonna set the exchange type equal to exchange type dot direct. I get it that you want me to make the code nice and neat. Please don't do that to me. I need to figure out how to turn that off. That's about going to drive me nuts. And I'm going to specify that the routing key equals B. Or no, this is A. This is service A. I'm going to do the same thing over here, except for this one, I'm going to specify the routing key equals B. And so the way direct exchanges work in RabbitMQ is when you send to a direct exchange, it looks at the routing key of the message and sends it to whichever exchange is bound to it with that routing key. So here where I publish my message, update account, I am gonna come in here and say x dot set routing key to, let's just say I want B to get this one. And this is, so this, this Delegate right here is being applied to the send context, which is where you can specify a number of things, publish context, send context, whatever. Um, and here you have access to all the different things in the headers, such as like adding message headers, setting conversation ID, correlation IDs, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm using it here with an extension method that knows how to set the routing key for RabbitMQ because it's a transport specific header and it's set on the RabbitMQ send context, which is in the payload of the particular send context. So calling set routing key, it should only send it to B. I need to make my account consumer a little smarter though. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say command received on, and I'm gonna have it output the Receive context dot input address, which is the input address of that receive endpoint that received the message. So now when I run this, I will see 
Nothing. Awesome. Oh, right, because I clearly didn't do something right. Oh, right, yeah. So it's giving me an error. Again, precondition failed. This exchange already exists, and it's a fan out exchange, but the current type is direct. So what happened? Because I set both of those direct. Well, it turns out that when I go to publish, if I go out here and look, see, this is where you're going to pull your hair out. Because you're going to go out here and look at update account, you're going to say, but it is a direct exchange. So this config, I configured the consume side of the topology, but I didn't configure the publish side. So if I go back to my project and I say config.publish update account, Exchange type direct. And the reason I have to do that is because when I go to publish, it's going to try to declare that exchange on the broker. And by default, all exchanges are fan out. This will tell it this is a direct exchange. So when you declare it, declare it as a direct exchange. Now when I run it, it should actually work. Because when I looked on the broker, it was already a direct exchange because the consume was set up first. And here we can see command received one, two, three, four, five on RabbitMQ localhost account service dash B. Let's add one message that's going to go to A just so we can tell the difference. We'll create this one as six, seven, eight, nine, zero. We'll even just put an A on it so that we know. And we'll set the routing key to A on that one. Run that. And now we'll see two messages. The 12345 is still received on B, and the 67890A is received on service A. So it's routing those using the direct exchanges, and the different receive endpoints are receiving those. That can be really useful if you have messages that you want to send to like particular, like if you have agents that are running on machines and your routing key is your host name or something like that and you want to send messages publish one message but use the routing key to route them to the appropriate endpoint perfectly acceptable way to do it what happens if i specify a routing key that doesn't exist always a good question looks like nothing Didn't fail, didn't blow up. I don't have any messages around. It disappears because there isn't a routing key map to it. So it isn't gonna go anywhere. How can I avoid that? Is there a way I could fix that? Gee, Chris, I don't know, let's find out. Well, I think there is, and this is where I'm getting into the, I think, therefore I don't know part. So I can specify an alternate exchange queue. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to call this um, unmatched for lack of a better cool name. And so what this is going to do is if I publish an update account to this direct exchange and it doesn't match a direct exchange consumer that's there, it should go to this alternate queue called unmatched. In theory. So let's find out. This will be like our fireworks and explosions finish. Because if it works, it's really cool. I don't think I've ever personally tried it in my life. Except, once again, <laughs> it's going to fail because the exchange type changed and now it has an alternate exchange attribute which is missing. So I'm going to kill this. I'm going to come out here. I'm going to go to the exchange. I'm going to come out here. I'm going to delete it so that it gets recreated. Those will still sit there. I'm going to go back to my code. I think I think I have to specify it in the consumer too, which is, or do I? 
I don't think I can set alternate exchange on the receive. This is going to be a good question. Like I said, I've never tried this, so I don't know if it works or not. We're going to find out. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to blow up again. Oh, it did work. Awesome. Maybe I was just confused. So now, if I go out to here, sure enough, there's an unmatched queue, and that unmatched queue has that message in it, which if I get it, you can see the exchange that it was originally sent to. So this gets set by RabbitMQ when you specify an alternate exchange. And this is all handled on the broker, by the way. It does all of this by itself. So you can see that sample contracts update account is the exchange it was really sent it to. The routing key was C. Because it didn't make it, it was moved there. And that's basically what happened. I don't think it puts a header or anything on it. But again, Mass Transit hasn't touched this message because it never went anywhere. Because it was sent to the broker to that endpoint. The alternate exchange was specified and so it was moved here. Um, if I go and look at that queue for unmatched and I look at the bindings, I can see it's bound to the unmatched exchange. And the unmatched exchange doesn't have any bindings on it. But if I go look at the update account, I can see that in the features, I have alternate exchange set to unmatched. And what that does is if you specify to a routing key that doesn't exist, it'll throw it into that unmatched queue. So you can, you can set it up to where you won't lose messages due to the fact that the message was um, not matched to a known routing key. So. So that's kind of a deep dive into all the different ways you can configure um, RabbitMQ. I covered the prefetch count and kind of showed how you can set that to show how many messages you have reading. Um, I was going to kind of go into middleware and stuff, but because we're already at like an hour, I imagine everybody wants a nap or, you know, whatever. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's kind of all the stuff that we can do with RabbitMQ. I mean, there's some other capabilities that are definitely fringe, but are out there. We covered the difference between send and publish, how the publish works, how the exchanges are configured. Um, yeah, so hopefully this was a good diversion from the sample that we've been building and kind of give a lot of the details about how to leverage RabbitMQ. Uh, if you do have questions or anything, hit us up on the Discord. Um, you know, that's, there's usually somebody always online, especially early in the day. Um, yeah, so have a good evening. Hopefully this was useful, and uh, we'll see you in the next show. Talk to you later.